So we're, we're busy with a series on red letters. We're keeping going with that. And the text is from Matthew chapter 16 today. I was going to preach this two weekends ago, but then I got another two weeks to think around what, <laughs> and Mark had to step in. Let's just pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day and we thank you that you're speaking to us all the time. I just thank you even for your presence here in the worship set, Lord. So, so tangible, you, you being with us, you ministering to us, you receiving our praises, Lord, as a fragrant offering to you this afternoon. And yeah, I thank you that you, you speak to us all the time. And even now, Lord, I pray you open our hearts that we might understand what you're saying and that we might receive that and that we might act on that. In the name of Jesus. Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he charged them strictly not to, um, to tell no one that he was the Christ. And so for, the question for me is this thing. What is the church? What is the church? And maybe before, that, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Before we go on, and before I tell you what I think the church is and what I feel the Bible is, why don't you just turn to somebody around you and try and say in one or two sentences what you believe, what is the church? Because I think it's quite important to engage with the topic. Just, just one minute, quickly, just turn to someone next to you or someone you don't know and tell them what, you, what is the church for you. Okay. Okay, if you don't have an answer yet, it's taken too long. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> it's interesting, in English we say, I'm going to church, right? In English you say, we're doing renovations now at the church. Think about that. So in English, church mostly means building. I'm going to the building where we have our church. I'm going to church. COVID has seriously disrupted that, right? <laughs> There's one lesson we learned last year is that the church is not a building because we can still be the church even when we're not able to meet together somehow. Church is not a building. When we look at the word church in the Bible, there are a few surprises, uh, shepherds, on the next slide. The first one is that the word church only occurs twice in the Gospels. Can we see that? Only in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. You'd think the church would be all over the Gospels, but it's not. It's only two places, and it's actually one passage that Jesus talks about it. The second surprise is that the English word church comes from the Greek word kyriakos, meaning belonging to the Lord. Kyrios means Lord. So church, the English word church, comes from the word kyriakos. And that word only occurs twice in the New Testament. And there it's translated as the Lord's Supper and the Lord's Day. It's got nothing to do with the church. That's the second surprise. The third surprise um, is that 114 times in the New Testament, the Greek word ecclesia is used and it is mistranslated or substituted with the English word church. The two mean something completely different. Church means belonging to the Lord. Um, and uh, ecclesia means something completely different. 
And so there are all kinds of conspiracy theories saying, what the, what is going on here? This is coming from the 1500s and 1600s when the Bible was first translated. Some people say that King James, who translated the King James, or who authorized the King James version, that he was a Freemason and they're trying to control the world and all kinds of conspiracy theories. But for whatever reason, the point is that when we look at our English Bible, the word church is misleading. It's not capturing the, and it's an inappropriate word to use. We should be using a different word because ecclesia doesn't mean church. And, and we've gotten so used to church that we don't even know what it means. We don't even know what, what was Jesus talking about. What, what is this? So and that's what we're doing today. We're going, we're going to say, what is the church? What is the ecclesia? That's the next slide, shepherd. See, Jesus is not using a new word. He's actually taking an old word from the Hebrew Old Testament. Um, in Jesus' time, they, they had translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. It was called the Septuagint. There were 70 people translating it. And in that Septuagint, so actually first let's just say, in the Hebrew Old Testament, there are 145 times that this Hebrew word, kahal, um, occurs. And it always means some form of a gathering or some form of, of an assembly, a congregating, people coming together. Out of those 145, 96 times this word kahal is translated as ecclesia in Greek. It's so ecclesia, the rest of it means synagogue, um, it, which means a religious gathering. So all, every time the, the, in the Hebrew there's the word kahal, it always means people gathering together. Of those, some of those are religious gatherings, others are just normal gatherings. But it's always got to do with gatherings. And this word ecclesia comes from two separate Greek words. The one is ek, means coming out of or called from, and, and the second word is kaleo, which means to be called. And so if you say ek and kaleo, ecclesia, it means a people called out of their homes into a public space by an authority figure. Ecclesia means people that are called out, out of their homes, into a public space to gather. What else do we learn from, from, from the, this is, this is the common meaning in the, in the Greek Old Testament. What else do we learn? The first thing is that they cannot be, this assembly of people cannot be, cannot be separated from somebody who calls. In order to be called, you need to have somebody calling. There's always an army general or there's God summoning his people like he did at Exodus 19. He said, come my people, come gather around at the foot of Mount Sinai. I want to talk to you. That is Ecclesia. The second thing is that this gathering always has a socio-political purpose determined by the occasion. Sometimes it's linked to the giving of instructions, sometimes uh, to different things. I can give a few examples. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, it describes this Exodus 19 moments where God summons the people to Mount Sinai. He wants to give them the law. He wants to show them what does it mean to be my people. In 1 Kings chapter 8, they, they, they use the word ecclesia to, to, to describe a time when Solomon was dedicating David or Solomon, I can't remember. One of the two, when they were Solomon, they were dedicating the temple, and just describing all the festivities and the people gathered. Ecclesia. In Judges chapter 20, Ecclesia, there's an Ecclesia of soldiers preparing for war. And it's the generals of the army pulling people together and saying, gather together. Ecclesia. Gather together. This is how we're going to go. Those of you going to go this way. Those of you going to go this way. It's the gathering together to receive instructions to go out to war. Ecclesia. And in Psalm 89, there's a picture of a heavenly assembly, the assembly of angels uh, in heaven worshiping God. The gathering together to worship. It's always a, a social, political purpose when people gather. And that is, that is part, of the, part of what this means to be church to be ecclesia. The third thing that we learn is that it's a communal activity. It's not individual. It's in a public space. It's not private. You see, to be in, in the ecclesia or to come together is to come together in public, to receive together instructions, everybody together. And so often, in our, in our understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, in our understanding of what the church is, it's not public, it's private. It's me, and, especially in my culture, you know, they say when you come to somebody's dinner party, just don't talk about politics and don't talk about religion. <laughs> because you, you might offend people. Because, because religion is seen as a private thing. It's me and my God, me and my relation. As long as I can have my religion, as long as I don't offend you. No. This is public. 
And it's not, it's not an individual thing, it's corporate. It's everybody together. That's ecclesia. So many times the gathering is for acts of worship, it's for communal repentance, it's for affirming the covenant between God and his people. And some people believe that the ecclesia then is mainly this group of people, the covenanting family. But every time of these 145 times that we see this word in the Bible, what we see is that the main meaning is that the ecclesia is a group of people gathering, having been summoned by their king or summoned by a leader to come and receive instructions and to go and do that all together. That's what it means to be the ecclesia, called out of your home into a public space, into a building, into a place to hear from your king. What's interesting is this, this is what Jesus would have had in mind when he used this word, ecclesia, I will build my church. I will build my church in Matthew 16. And he says, I'm going to be that king like Yahweh summoned the Israelites at Mount Sinai. I am now calling the people of God. I am the one who's got the authority to call. I'm the one that's got authority to hold people together. And I'm going to give them instructions. He's like the great military leader, like the commander, commander of the armies of heaven is now saying to his armies of people here, come my people. I want to show you where the battle is going to be in this next season. I want to show you how to fight. I want to show you how to take ground from the enemy. Who do you say I am? Jesus asked Peter. It's interesting. Derek had that same kind of scripture at the beginning of the service. Who do you say I am? Jesus is not only the good shepherd. Jesus is not only the friend of sinners. Jesus is the commander of the armies of heaven. And Jesus is the commander of his people that are gathered together, summoned together, called out of their homes so that they can take the gospel forward to all the ends of the world. It's interesting to ask sometimes the the, the question, if you look at these words, what did, what did Jesus say? But it's also interesting to ask the negative question, what didn't Jesus say? If I wrote the Gospel of Matthew, I probably would have said, made Jesus say, I will build my kingdom. The kingdom of God is such a big theme for Matthew. This whole Gospel is around how Jesus is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't say, I will build my kingdom because he doesn't see the building of his kingdom separate to the building of his people. The kingdom and the people go together. The gathering of God's, communi- of God's family of worshipers, that is how the kingdom will be built. So Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to build my kingdom. He says, I will build my people who are going to gather together, who are going to hear from me, who are going to worship me, and they are going to take my kingdom to the ends of the earth. See, the kingdom of God will come. But the ecclesia, the church, is the frontier of that kingdom. It's the front end. It's the way through which God wants to change the world. The kingdom is the place where light and darkness meet. The kingdom is the place where it's the coal face of the kingdom. Think of a mining illustration. It's the place where where people take rocks out of the ground and chip them until you can see the gold that's inside. And that is the church. That's the church, that is the ecclesia, the, the coal face of the kingdom, where, where light meets darkness. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to build my kingdom. He says, I'm going to build my kingdom through you as you gather together under my command and under my instruction. The second thing Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't say, I will build my temple. In the Old Testament and in Jesus' day, the temple was the main symbol of 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 society's religious, it's like the center of religious action. It's the place where people gathered, it's the place where people worshiped, it's the place where you came to offer your sacrifices to make peace with God. Jesus' focus is not on the size of the building. It's not on the size of the building or how beautiful the ceremonies and the liturgies and the songs and everything is. He's not interested in what the band sounds like, to use today's language and whether the seats are comfortable, and whether the lighting and the air conditioning is just right. His focus is on the people. And he says, the gathered people are meant to be in this building to worship, but they're mainly meant to be out there to bring the kingdom to all the nations. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to to build my temple. I'm going to make a great place for everybody. He says, I want to build my people as they gather. It's interesting, we need to be in the temple to be out in the world. There's a, it's almost like your, your battery. My cell phone is getting really old, so I need to keep charging my battery. And you charge and you discharge and you charge and you discharge. 
Friends, we come here to charge and to be charged by God's presence, but we go out to discharge. And by God's grace, I'm trusting that we're all running and emptying ourselves, emptying of what God is depositing in our hearts all the time. Jesus doesn't say, I'm building my temple, I'm building my people, I'm building my church. The third thing he doesn't say is, he doesn't say, I'm going to build my disciples. Again, if I was Matthew, I would have probably said disciples would have been my number two option. Jesus was the great rabbi for Matthew. He was that great teacher who who inspired pupils to come to him and to to come and learn from him and to, to take on his faith and to take on his way of life. That's what people did in those times. You you came up to a wise teacher and said, please, teacher, I want to learn from you. I want to become like you. And Jesus doesn't say, I will build my disciples. Discipleship is a personal journey, right? It's It's that journey where each one of us have to come before God and ask God to make us a better person. Ask God to help us get rid of our, uh, our filth and our junk and our sinfulness. Ask God to bring healing to the pain that's in our hearts. Discipleship is us following Jesus, the, the walk that Jesus, personal, intimate walk. But discipleship is in the context of a larger gathering of people. See, all the gospels speak of discipleship, but Jesus' focus is not on the individual. He doesn't want to create unlinked individuals that are all on a, on a personal journey with Jesus. He wants to gather them together as an army and send them out to change the world. Jesus' focus is not on, only on what you're going to become when, when you spend your quiet time with Jesus. He wants to see what we can become when we join hands Yeah, the collective is always stronger than the sum of the individuals, right? I'm sure there must be a physics law like that. Please, can the engineers help me out? (laughs) But it's always like that. The collective is stronger than the individuals. There's some fascinating videos. I I saw one again this week of uh, the, the Maasai tribe in Kenya do this. But I know that's an ancient Bushman tradition also, where, where, where a few guys of the Maasai, this video that I saw, a few guys, literally there's part of their initiation culture, where to prove that you're a man, you need to go and steal, <laughs> you need to go steal meat from the mouth of a lion. So they have to find a lion that's recently killed something, and the first problem is the lion are always killing at night, so you have to find a lion that's killed something in the daytime, and then you have to go and slice off meat from the kill. And you see this video, I, this, this one video I saw was just three guys actually, another video I saw was about 10. And literally the guys, they plan it and they stand in ambush and they're kind of sitting down, hunching, and then they go, boom, boom, boom. And they walk straight up to the lions. The lions get the fright of their life. They don't know what the heck is going on here. The lions run away, the guys cut off the meat and they go away. You can never do that as one guy. <laughs> You'd be crazy. You would be part of the, of the eating fest. <laughs> but somehow, somehow they, these, guys, these ancient cultures knew that if we stand up as 10 men, the lions are going to run away. And Jesus says, gather together my people. I want to chase away the lions. He says, the gates of hell will not prevail. The picture is one of an attack on the gates of hell. Imagine you've got a, you've got a gate and there's a force being, you're belting this thing with a hammer and, and eventually it comes crumbling down. Jesus says, together, we're going to bash this thing down. So many people today think that I can be a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. I can be a Christian on my own as long as I read my Bible, as long as I pray, as long as I'm a good person, I I try and do business in a good way, I raise good kids, it's fine. Friends, it's not fine. And I think we have to say it for what it is. It's not fine. 
In the Bible, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as an ungathered church. There's no such thing as, as, as different believers just all in their own silos. No, we are together. We are an ecclesia. We are a called out people. By definition, that's who we are. And when you get saved, when you begin to follow Jesus, what you do is you join, you join the mass movement of people, God's people who are under his instruction, worshiping together, charging their batteries so that they can go discharge that all over the world. There's no such thing as discipleship without ecclesia, without gathering. Jesus didn't say, I will build my disciples. He said, I will build my church. I will build my church. An interesting thing that I sometimes do, those in my, in my home group know, we talked about this the other day. Um, when, when you approach a, doing a Bible study, and this is a helpful tip, and you want to go a little bit deeper into the text, one thing that you can do is, so, is you say the same, th the same phrase over. In this case, our phrase is, I will build my church, five words. But then you emphasize different words, and you see and you reflect on that and see what it, what it does. So we're going to do that right now. So if you take the first word and you say, I will build my church. Jesus is that big I. Jesus is the one who will build his church. Jesus is the great builder. Jesus is the great commander in chief. Jesus is the great I am. It's not the strategy of man. It's not the plans. It's not the buildings. It's not the programs. It's not the elders. It is Jesus who leads his church and Jesus that is in charge and Jesus that sets the agenda and Jesus that will lead this church and every other church. And sometimes we as men and women just need to get out of the way so that Jesus can lead us more. May God help us. Jesus is the great shepherd. And if you read the book of 1 Peter, it talks, about, it talks about Jesus as the great shepherd, and then it talks to his elders as under shepherds. You've got the great shepherd and the under shepherds. That's the right view of the church. I will build my church. Second word. It changes the meaning. Not I might build my church, I will. See, there's gonna be opposition to the building of the church, but Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand back. There can be nothing that can stop the plan of God. There can be nothing that can delay the plan of God. We might think that coronaviruses and pandemics and what all, whatever's going through your life, I will. I will build my church, I will. There's, the, there's that scripture that says not one letter of the law will come to, will, will, will where is this, Matthew 7? Not one dot or a, a dot or a tittle, uh, not one part of even one word of the letter of the law will, will, will not come to pass. I will build my church. Jesus knows what he's doing, friends, even when we don't know what's, what he's doing. He's in, he's in control. He's got a master plan. And it's incredible to think if you can try and stretch your brain that his master plan even covers over your own sin and includes your free choice. <laughs> try and think about that. Doesn't matter what you choose, you're still inside of the master plan of God and he can use that as part of the bigger picture that you never even knew was as big as you thought it was. <laughs> I've tried for years to figure that out. There's free choice and there's the master plan of God. And you think you've got free choice, but God knows he's got everything under control. It's quite something. I will build my church. Third word. Jesus is not maintaining his church. He's not trying to keep it alive. He's building, he's growing, he's expanding his church. He's not trying to stop the church from falling apart or from splitting up. That's what people do try and split churches because of small things. No, Jesus is building his church. He's actively building his church. I, I stopped to think in, this, in the last few weeks, what does it mean to build a church? It's easy to figure out how do you build a building. Yes, you put cement and bricks and things. How do you build a people? What is Jesus doing when he says, I will build my gathered people? A few things come to mind. He is strengthening our unity. 
He's strengthening our collective and our strength. In John chapter 17, the last words that Jesus prays is for unity of the church. It's for unity of the believers. He says, Father, let these be one, even as I am one with you and you are in me and I am in you and you are in me and I am in you and the Spirit is in you and let them all be one. Let them all be united. That's building the church. Let them have single-minded focus and vision. Let them keep me front and center, follow my commands every step of the way. Building the church is about us learning to be responsive to God's call. So hearing his voice, identifying it's God speaking, and then saying yes to that in the moment. Not yes two years later, or yes five years later, or ten years later. If you've got kids, you know that delayed obedience is pretty much the same as disobedience. (laughs) Kids, go tidy up your room. Yes, mom, I'll do it later. It's pretty much the same as disobedience, right? Triana's nodding furiously. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's what it means to build a church God is strengthening our capacity he's sharpening our ears he's strengthening our resolve so that we might say yes to him no matter what I will build my church fourth word I will build my church again friends this, is, this, this church City Gate Church is not Mark and, and my church. We happen to be elders at this time. But at any given moment, God can take us out and put any other elders here and it's still God's church. It's still Jesus' church. We don't run the church. We manage it on his behalf. And we try as best to steward what God is saying and steward the resources on God's behalf. This is not my church. This is God's church. It's also not your church, it's God's church. He is at the head of this church. There's the beautiful picture of the, uh, in Ephesians, end of Ephesians chapter one and Ephesians chapter two, uh, where Jesus says, I am, you know, he is the head of the church, which is the body of Christ. We are the body, but he is the head. He's the, the commanding center. That's, this is where all the instructions go, right? It starts up here and it goes through the nervous systems to all the ends of your body so they can do whatever you meant to do. Jesus is the head of the church. The other thing about that is that we, we identify ourselves by him. We belong to him. He is, he's the one who sets the tone for what happens here. He's the one who sets the culture. He's the, one, he's the one around whom we define ourselves. Not the culture of the day, not what seems popular. No, whatever Jesus says, that's who we are. Last word, I will build my ecclesia. Not my apostolic networks, not my bank balance, not my fancy buildings, not my incredible projects. I will build my group of people who gather, my tribe of worshipers that stand ready to do whatever I say. That's the church. A tribe of worshiping soldiers of Christ gathering together all the time to hear from him. There's a a prophecy from the book of Haggai on the next slide there, Shepard, that I feel is going to be helpful as we just think, what what does this mean for us? I don't know if anybody's ever read Haggai. It's one of those rather hidden books. The third last one of the Old Testament has just got two chapters. But he writes this just in the time that Jerusalem was being rebuilt. It's after the exile. The first lot of people have come back. I think some of the second lot of people have come back and they started building, rebuilding the temple and they kind of got distracted. And then Haggai comes and says, the word of the Lord came by the, hand, by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And God says, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, the temple, lies in ruins? And a few verses later, he continues this thought. He says, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I might be glorified, says the Lord. See, this Haggai message, I feel, is timely for us. That that was after great destruction and great rebuilding, just like now. This is a season of rebuilding for the church. It's a season for rebuilding for the whole world, actually. And the temple was the place where people gathered to worship. No temple, no gathering, no worship, no ecclesia. 
We can build many things. We can build careers, we can build your family, you can build wealth, you can build your home, you can build your garden, you can build your marriage relationships. These are all good, and these must be done. But we cannot do this at the expense of an intentional building and a consistent investing into the church. Investing of your heart, investing of your time, investing of your money, investing of your life and of your presence. See, this is the priority of Jesus. I will build my church. Not the temple, not individual unit, but the unity of the collective believers coming together, worshiping together, so that the chorus echo loud, or choruses echo louder and louder and louder into, into all, all of heaven. So the question is, if Jesus is building his church, what are you and I building? Just think about that. What, what are you building? Everybody's building something. Otherwise, you're going nowhere. What are you building? Jesus is building his church. Second phrase from that book of Haggai that stands out for me is, this house lies in ruins. See, people have drifted away. Like sheep, some of them have lost their way, some of them have become disconnected from this family, from this church. For many reasons, some good, some not so good. If you look around you, try and, try and remember who, who did you used to sit next to at church when we were still at the school hall. Everybody had their season ticket seats in their old ducks in the front row on the left here. And now oh, we know. <laughs> who did you used to sit next to that is no longer here? Some people have lost their way. Some people have lost their way, and that's a concern. Another concern is that some people are still in the church, and the, but they've gone into self-protection mode. It focuses on surviving, maybe fun, surviving financially, maybe surviving emotionally, maybe just trying to survive spiritually, but they're not taking any new ground. And an army that doesn't take new ground, it's not a proper army, it's on the retreat. Jesus says, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the attack that's coming from this group of people. And so that's a problem when we're not taking new ground. That's a concern. The army of God, this army of God, is a little bit weaker than what it was a year or two ago. A third concern. Some people have begun to enjoy watching TV and watching church on Facebook Live. Bless you all at home. <laughs> no, we need, we need to say it as it is. It's quite convenient to watch church in your pajamas whenever it's when it, with a cup of coffee and WhatsApp open on the other hand, while your kids can run around and do whatever they want. Right? I mean, we need to, we need to be honest. This is a family moment. Ecclesia means assembly, just like a school assembly. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. If you don't line up with the other soldiers for battle, you're not part of the army. If you're not in active duty, you're not part of the ecclesia. There's an active and a passive element. And we need to watch out that we don't, that we don't become passive. We're in active duty of the living God. You're watching church, not participating. There's quite a big difference. See, online tools are kind of a, a helpful way to keep communicating, to pass information over. But it's really only for a temporary, a temporary solution for a time of distress. I don't see any, I don't see any kind of template for this in the Bible. Obviously, they didn't have online, but a temp I don't see a template for a church that doesn't meet all together all the time. If you read the book of Acts, you see they, they met daily in each other's homes. They met in the temple. They met in the public places. They met in each other's homes. There's a day-to-day -day communal element of living out your faith. 
Online tools is a means to an end to keep people together, to keep connective connectivity going when we can't meet. And there might be another wave. We might all be back at home watching Facebook Live. <laughs> but as best we can, friends, there are currently 63 COVID cases in the whole province, average per day. Let no one say it's because of a great health risk that they are not here. How many people in the province? I don't know, 10 million. 63 out of 10 million. My concern is that God's army has become passive. God's army is sitting back. Soldiers, soldiers need to have weapons strapped to them and be ready for action. And the fourth concern is that the church that is gathered here, all of us, we're not so well organized at the moment, right? Our systems have been disrupted. So we currently have, for example, only about one third of the manpower that we need to run successful kids' ministry. Nikki and Pinky were both on worship and kids this week. We are also about one third of the capacity to run broadcasting and sound and media successfully. If it wasn't for Glenridge offering us some help in this last time, we would not have been able to do this. That's just being real. Our systems have been disrupted. This, the army is not well organized. Friends, it's time to organize ourselves so that we can take ground, so that we can host people well, so that our children can be discipled, and so that we can all enjoy a great cup of coffee and, and really bond together well. If you call this a part of your home, consider where is God, where is God leading you to serve? Every soldier has a place. Every person has a place. And God has uniquely skilled you and gifted you and given you a passion to both serve here and serve in your community wherever you are. We need to do both really well. Yeah. What's God saying? God's saying, consider your ways and build my house. Build the ecclesia with Jesus. Think about how you live. Think about what is important in your life. But choose the people of God. Choose the things of God. Choose what is important to Jesus. The second thing God is saying through this prophet of Haggai, he says, go up to the hills. I find that interesting. We've just been in the mountains. <clears throat> Some people were not looking that fresh coming back from that hike. The photos were all from the beginning of the hike. <laughs> We're also, I'm, I'm a bit guilty here, but slightly underestimated how long it's going to take. <laughs> we are, it's underestimated it by about half. <laughs> Go up to the hills, to the top of the hill, not to the bottom of the hill. Go and fetch the best wood so that you can build a great temple for me, says God. Make an effort. Go out of your way. Make an effort. Yes, it's going to be heavy. Yes, your legs are going to be sore. Yes, you're going to be out of breath. Make an effort, not only to find the building materials, but to find the people. Because church is about people, people that are lost. I'm reminded of that, that scripture, Abel and Cain, and, and, and Cain just killed Abel, and then God, I think it's Genesis 4 or Genesis 14, I can't remember, 4 probably, and, um, and God comes to, to, to Cain just after he killed Abel and says, he says, Cain, where's your brother? And he tries to think, that he th it kind of thinks that God probably doesn't know what's going on. I don't know what he was thinking. But, um, and he says, I don't know. And, and, and he says, am I my brother's keeper? And you know that half of the New Testament talks about how we are our brother's keeper. Half, if you read any of the books of Paul, like the first half is normally theology, the second half is application. How are we meant to live in community? How are we meant to stir each other up towards good deeds? How are we meant to help each other put on the new self and get rid of the old self? You are your brother's keeper. We are going to be held accountable not only for our own lives, but for the extent to which we were discipling and reaching out to those around us to say, come, let me help you follow Jesus. Let me help you become the person you were destined to be. Let me, let, me, let me help you get rid of some of the mud so that you can be a bright diamond shining for the glory of God. You are your brother's keeper. 
And God says, go up to the hills and go and find your brothers. Go and find the people that are lost, that are hurting. Find your brother and sister that hasn't been back in this church community simply because they've lost their way. They've gotten distracted. Have a loving and a graceful conversation with your brother or your sister who's in self-protection mode and not taking new ground. Pray for them. Minister to them. Speak gentle words. Restore them. Bring them back. Speak vision and destiny to those people that have become passive. Those people that have become consumers of church rather than participants in church. Speak destiny. So you know what God's plan for your life is, my friend. Let, let's talk around that. What, are you, what were you born to do? And let's get off your bum and let's start doing that. If you can say that in a nice way. <laughs> I'm still practicing. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got a relationship with someone, you can actually say, have, have pretty real conversations about that, which is why it's good to have lots of coffees together and just talk about nonsense, because then when sometimes you have to have a, a conversation with substance, you, you've got the, the, the relational credibility. You say, what's the plan of God over your life, bud? You weren't born to do this. You were born to take over the world. You're born to plant churches. You're born to raise up leaders. You, you're born to, to, to be an entrepreneur. You're born to change the, the face of this industry. Whatever it is, call out destiny over the people that have become lost in themselves, become consumers, sitting back instead of taking new ground. Call out destiny. Speak vision. Prophesy. Bring the dry bones back to life and invite them to come to war with you. Say, come, I'm going. Follow me as I follow Christ. Come, we're going on a mission trip. Come, we're going on camp. Come, I'm going to home group. Come, we're doing a Bible study program. Come, we're doing a section on prayer. We're learning how to pray. Come, we're going to fast. Come, as you follow Jesus courageously, and as you take steps of faith, you say to your friend, come, speak vision, and pull them along. And the last thing is, what God is saying is step up and ask God, where does he want to deploy you? Each, if you think of the army again, each section of the army has got a frontier to fight. Each section has got a place. And God is uniquely, uniquely skilled and gifted you. Put passions in your heart. Put skills, put skill sets, put understanding. He's given you a skill set to be able to reach a people that I can never reach and that Derek can never reach and Warren can. Each one of us is, is different for that reason so that we can reach a different crowd, a different people. Where is God calling you to take new ground? Not in five years' time. Now, before the end of the year. Now, this month of May. What's the ground that's before you? Who are the people and how is it going? Because that's the church. The church is a group of people that hear from God, where is my next battle? Where is, my, where, where, is the, where is the next place that I need to invest myself and plow myself and discharge my, my energy levels and my money for the sake of your kingdom? Yeah, find that. And if you're not sure, let's pray together because God, God speaks when we pray. When you ask God, he will show you. And I promise you, it's not going to take long. Monday to Saturday, where are you going to serve? Where are you going to invest yourself in? And what's the ground that God calls you to take? I will build my church. The kingdom of God is coming. Jesus is unstoppable. Yeah. Let's get, let's get going. Let's go for it. I feel there's a real invitation for us to join in with him. I will build my church. Amen.